Good morning. The second series of the lecture on Girish Khanna's Tughlaq. In this lecture, I shall be dealing with Girish Khanna's Tughlaq and the treatment of history. I shall be discussing on the composition history of Tughlaq, then Muhammad bin Tughlaq as he is represented in history. I shall be focusing also on the historical perspectives, the treatment of historical subject in the play. Tughlaq and the role of history, the relevance of the play in 1960s, and commenting on the contemporary relevance of the play. Girish Khanna's Tughlaq is his second play, composed in 1964. It tells the story of the 14th century Sultan Muhammad bin Tughlaq, and the play remains among the best known of his works. He penned another historical. Play Tipu Sultan, Kanda Kanasu, Dreams of Tipu Sultan in 2000. Kanda's account of the genesis of Tughlaq, 1964, reveals his main intention. While he was a student at Oxford University as a Rhodes Scholar in the early 1960s, he felt challenged by the verdict of noted Canadian Kannada critic Kirtinath Kurkotti. that modern kannada drama had no first rate historical plays and with this he began a process of self education in pre modern indian history to search a possible dramatic subject this recourse into the historical past has often been the purpose of several dramatists the marvelous discovery of mohammed bin tughlaq in elementary level textbook motivated girish kannad to take on a full scale research on the historiographic materials that were available at oxford and this in turn led him to a series of revelations about the uncanny persistence of the past in india in an interview in 1971 girish kannad recalls that tughlaq struck him as i quote the most idealistic and the most intelligent king ever to come to the throne of delhi including the moguls unquote but this ruler according to kannad nevertheless ended as i quote one of the greatest failures because of the contradictions within his own personality and the self defeating nature of his politics the 20 year period of tughlaq's rule his decline as a ruler had also a striking parallel to the first two decades of indian independence under pandit jawaharlal nehru who was also as idealistic but his leadership was equally troubled nehru appeared remarkably like tughlaq to girish kannad in his propensity for failure despite an extraordinary intellect yet the play was not meant either as an obvious comment on nehru or as an exact parallel to the present situation of the 1960s rather the play addressed the emerging ambivalence of power relations in the political and public spheres that were based for the first time in the indian history on the principles of mass representation voting rights and enfranchisement in a sense kannad observes i quote the play reflected the slow disillusionment that my generation felt with the new politics of independent india the gradual erosion of the ethical norms that had guided the movement for independence and the coming to power in terms with cynicism and real politics the play draws from the rich tradition of plays based on history as was popularized by the elizabethan and jacobian playwrights like christopher marlowe William Shakespeare, John Webster, or by the plays based on history enacted on the Indian stage by Dwijendra Lal Rai, Utpal Dutta, and others, Kannad follows Anton Chekhov's indirect action plays, and also follows Brechtian epic and dialectical theatre, especially Brecht's use of historicization in his play Tughlaq. In the annals of history, Muhammad bin Tughlaq is known as a man of brilliant ideas, and can be 
said to be one of the most striking sultans of the medieval India. He was, of course, a trained intellectual, a keen student of Persian poetry and a philosopher, a lover of science and mathematics. He's also known for the idea of central capital, centralization of power and experiments with the nominal token currency. These ideas were all good, but he was in a hurry and was very impatient of the slow adoption of his measures. All those who could not keep pace with his imagination became victim of the wrath and were punished severely. The result was, of course, that Muhammad bin Tughlaq as a Sultan proved himself as a complete failure before the history of forces toppled him. We know about the period of Muhammad bin Tughlaq from the materials of Jiauddin Barni. Barni's main work are Tuarik A. Firuz Zasai and Fatwa A. Zahan Dari. We know about first six years of Tughlaq's rule from Barni's works. Then another important work is left by Ibn Batuta. Ibn Batuta has discussed in his travels and the incursions in contemporary Islamic world and has documented them in his Rihiya. He was appointed as Qazi by Muhammad Tughlaq and was also appointed ambassador to China. Ibn Butata gives detail about the later part of his rule. Portrait of Muhammad bin Tughlaq in Batuta's words draw our attention. His, I quote, his gateway is never free from a beggar whom he has relieved and never free from a corpse he has slain. So we have a mixed personality. He is the greatest donor who lives in the world of his dreams. Muhammad bin Tughlaq generously scattered almost incredible wealth among the foreign visitors, learned men, poets, officials, beggars, diseased, and so on. His impoverished treasury, his project to conquer Persia, Khurswan expedition, his dreams to keep a huge standing army, and his plans to invade China, Kwarichi expedition, finished his entire treasury. His ideas of invading China met with a disastrous result in the process of the journey through Himalayan passes where men and money got split like water. Muhammad bin Tughlaq in history is also remarkable for his tax reforms. The empty treasures needed fresh taxation. He wanted 5 to 10 percent more revenue from the Duab region, which was a fertile land of his reign between the Gangetic Plain and the plains of River Yamuna. The oppressive taxes reduced the farmers to mendicancy. They stopped filling the land, tilling the land. They lost confidence and burned their stacks. The cattle were turned loose and moved to jungle. The tax reform of Sultan got failed. This was followed by a disastrous famine and the unfortunate subject were left in deplorable condition for many years to come. Another great decision of Muhammad bin Tughlaq was to transfer his capital. The inconvenience to rule the wealthy Deccan induced Sultan to take step and transfer the seat of his government to Dalatabad, somewhere near Pune in Maharashtra. The idea might have been practical and reasonable if it had ever thought of shifting the official court of Delhi. But he wanted to transport the whole population of Delhi to the new capital. The inhabitants of Delhi were made to leave their homes and were forced to march 700 miles down south with their women, children and all belongings they could carry. Many were killed on the way in this 40 days journey and few could hardly survive. He ordered the people back to Delhi after five years and the result was only a few could survive even on the return. He's also famous for Diwan Ekohi. Sultan got enough wisdom to understand the distress caused by 
the famine and the result of his excessive taxation. In 1341, he abolished the taxes and started getting it twice a week, sitting to hear the complaints of the oppressed. He started distributing daily food to the people of Delhi. He also established a loan system to the peasants, loan waivers to the peasants. He created a department of agriculture named Divan A. Kohi and established a famine code to relieve the victims of famine. Another great task he undertook was experiment with token currency. The heavy drainage of the treasury led him to do another disastrous experiment of a token currency. The idea of token currency was probably borrowed from paper money issued by his nearly by contemporary Kublai Khan in China. He introduced the copper brass coins instead, which were to pass at the value of the contemporary silver taka. The silver coin introduced by Mohammed bin Tughlaq was called Adi. The gold coin which was finally engraved was called Dinar. He did not foresee the consequence of his monetary experiment. He was aware that the value of token money depends upon the credit of the treasury, but forgot that none other than the state could issue the tokens. Any skilled Hindu engraver could therefore copy the inscription and strike the copper coin token, the value of the tanka. The result was that house of every Hindu turned into a mint and the Hindu produced coins in tens of millions. They paid their tribute, purchased horses, arms, clothes, and all other, all other things with this forced currency. The local rajas and village headmen became rich and stronger, but the government became weaker and poorer day by day. The value of these coins fell so low that they become worth pebbles. This forced Sultan to repeal the edict that he gave and ordered to bring the copper coins to the treasury in exchange of old coins in silver and gold. Thousands of men from all the corners flocked with these copper coins to the capital and exchanged them with gold and silver takas. So much of copper coins were brought to the treasury that heaps of them raised like mountain. The experiment got a disastrous end. The innovations of Sultan exasperated and people and Sultan became unpopular. There was of course a widespread discontent and rebellion. Bit by bit the empire disintegrated. One province after another revolted. Sultan could suppress the rebels at one point but could not be everywhere. Amid such chaos and confusion, in 1351, Muhammad bin Tughlaq died. This has been recorded in the annals of history, notably by these Islamic historians and also by the British historians during the colonial era. During the colonial era, we also have some Indian historians writing the history of Muhammad bin Tughlaq and the confusion remains. The contradictions in the character remain in the historical annals. Girish Kandar is trying to relate these contradictions in his play Tughlaq. Among the historians, there is an east-west divide in the representation of Tughlaq. This can be called politics of historical representation. Christianity and Western conceptions of monarchy presumably developed Tughlaq's moral sense along with his intellect. But in absence of free civilizing influences, surrendered to tyranny and madness since independence, his character became a representation of the Western view of the monarchical ambition, the ideological resistance to the oriental despot and the move towards a revolutionary history of medieval India have become increasingly evident in the works of Indian historians. While the British historians were trying to prove that they have liberated India from the rule of the Islamic invaders, the Indian historians tried to see the history of India in their own way. For example, K. N. Nizami points out that in presenting the historical literature of medieval India, British historian Eliot blackened the Indian past to glorify the British present 
and use medieval Indian history as an instrument for the implementation of the formula counterpoise of Indians against Indians divide and rule policy that evolved during the British rule in the college called Fort William College by the British Army Commission. Romila Thapar also comments in her history of India that the era of Islamic conquest far from being the dark age is also a formative period which rewards detailed study since many institutions of present day India began to take enduring shape during this period. Chaudhuri K. N. Chaudhuri describes Tughlaq's experiment with token currency as a serious monetary innovation anticipated by half anticipated half a century the introduction of the paper currency in China in the inaugural volume of the projected annual series entitled Medieval India Irfan Habib and Ayat Siddiqui use extensive research documentation to discuss the same historical subject and they state that the ruling class of the 13th century and the social mobility in the Dilni Sultanate necessitates some social reforms. The historiographic initiative must recognize the cultural context of Tughlaq because the object of revisionary interpretation is the same in the play. Kannar revives the paradoxical Tughlaq of history and occasionally constructs his dialogue verbatim from the historical documents creating a complex ideological and intertextual connection between history, historiography and his own action. Indeed, the play intervenes actively in the controversies that are presented in the historical texts. There is an effort to give a psychological explanation to the problems and analyze the enigmatic hero and by thematizing the issues of cultural difference inherent in the historical debate, Girish Kannad is trying to present Tughlaq in a new light. So the popular documentation of Tughlaq in the history books has been changed, partly fictionalized by Girish Kannad. Tughlaq invokes significant elements of modern Indian political and cultural experience by presenting an ostensibly unpolemical, self-sufficient historical narrative that contemporary Indian audience can apply to their own situation. In Western concept of historical drama, this synchronic force of history parallels the present continuity between the past and the present. So we have a central assumption of history, plays of all times and styles. There is a simple way that a writer can achieve such continuity to keep the play as objective as possible and leave the play to the audience's knowledge of what has happened as Brecht does in Life of Galileo, the popular annals of history and the representation of Galileo in the text differ remarkably. This universal criteria cannot however be appropriated to the Indian context because the audience's knowledge of history is discontinuous and heavily meditated by different ruling historical classes or ruling classes as the ruling class writes history. Tughlaq is resonant as a historical parallel because it incorporates these problems of history writing but the pre-modern and the medieval age in India has a striking resemblance with the political culture of pre-independence India and two decades after Indian independence. The audience of the 1960s, when the play was actually produced, saw some identification in the historical narrative. Kannar's play expressed the disenchantment and cynicism that attended the end of Nehru's era. Nehru ruled from 1947 to 1964. This decade later, the play appeared to be an uncanny accurate portrayal of the brilliant but authoritarian and opportunistic political style of Nehru's follower, successor, Honorable Prime Minister Indira Gandhi. Now Tughlaq seems concerned less with the specific figures than with two general political issues that have become dominant in the public sphere. 
First is the untenability of the idealism and the visionary politics that Mahatma Gandhi or Pandit Jawaharlal Nehru practiced as national leaders and valorized in their respective meditations on political action. For example, in Gandhi's The Story of My Experiments with Truth or Nehru's Discovery of India. This is overt. The second is the politics of power and authority, of power relations between groups that are separated by religious, racial, regional differences. In a society that is poised between secular and the fundamental ideologies, we have disparities and the representation politics works in this case. Homi Bhava, Homi Ke Bhava speaks of a movement from the problematic unity of the nation to the articulation of cultural difference in the construction of an international perspective. Tuglab grounds the problematic unity of the nation in historically inherited pluralities of religion and community and class that thwart the construction even of a national perspective. So we have different perspectives in the play that come together in the making of history. The divide between the East and the West, of course, contribute to the making of the play where we have the presence of an Eastern historian who tries to see, negotiate with his own history being a present in the play and recording the events in present tense. Conrad's revisiting of the historical perspectives or the historical milieu of the play provides the basis of an exploration of the mind of the protagonist where hidden uncertainties and fears come to the fore. The situation becomes more and more grim. With the help of historicization, the familiar and the predictable historical events are shown afresh to produce a startling effect, somehow to jolt the spectators with surprise and illuminate the new significance. In Tughlaq, history becomes a subject of central concern, with the protagonist drawn from history, speculating on the course and outcome of history itself. And in this historical narrative, we have the presence of two fictional characters, Aziz and Azam, who suffered the dominant ruling class history through their action. The history of Muhammad bin Tughlaq is a product of primarily medieval Muslim and colonial British traditions of historiography, whose modes of ideological implication have only recently begun to be scrutinized. So we have so many historians disputing the legacy of the rulers of the past. This 14th century historian, Jiauddin Barani, who is present in the play, defines history as a form of knowledge, essential for the understanding of the salient aspects of Islam and the aims to educate Muslim sultans in their duty towards their faith. And in this framework, Tughlaq becomes a repugnant subject because of his disregard for Quran in dealing with both the faithful and the faithless and his attempt to limit Islam's influence in a political and judicial sphere in India. Barani deliberately selects his material to portray Tughlaq as a foolish apostate who ruined his empire by pursuing the wrong beliefs and following the wrong advice. This was a tradition among the historians and they always played with symbolism. For example, Amir Khusro wrote the history of Alauddin Khilji and the Pahelis of Khusro still remain unsolved. Although his Tughlaq Nama, Tughlaq Nama is not on Muhammad bin Tughlaq, Rather, it is a historical account of his father. So he did not survive to write the history of Tughlaq, Muhammad bin Tughlaq. The orientation, orientalist commentators, they treat the turmoil of Muslim rule in India in a way that they can show the superiority of the British colonial rule. So the orientation towards the East, the grand project writing the East is also a project that must demonize the East, especially the historical past, in order to present the story, the narrative, the grand narrative 
of colonial missionary educative commercial enterprise so we have a mohammedan ruler and this ruler according to henry eliot the intrinsic value of this work is small and the native subjects were devastated by the steps taken by tughlaq barani on the other hand has attacked tughlaq's acts of cruelty and considered them un-islamic but he nevertheless appreciate tughlaq's visionary insight after the mid 19th century british historians who wrote about the medieval india drew both on barani and eliot to cast tughlaq as a brilliant but unprincipled so this is a balance that the historians gradually got through and naturally he became oriental despot like elphinstone who acknowledges tughlaq as one of the wonders of the age but also ascribes him ascribes to him a uh, i quote from elphinstone perversion of judgment which leaves us in doubt whether he was not a bad ruler guided by a degree of insanity even vincent smith calls that this is an astonishing monster how he could retain power for 26 years and how he could die in his bed even lenpool concludes that sultan made no allowance for the native dislike of innovations and so with the best intention excellent ideas with no balance of patience he simply became a epitome of failure this treatment of historical subject in a play like tughlaq follows a chronology of tughlaq's reign it closely mixes the historical and fictional characters with brechtian finesse and creates a grand spectacle grand narrative of state for which the stage is particularly well suited in addition to the overall engagement with written history the play also appropriates to a specific historiographic intertext the tarike firozi sahi of tughlaq's court historian jiauddin barani that is used here as a basic narrative his attitudes and positions of the text kannad analyzes in 13 scenes of tughlaq as a sequence of self cancelling actions dialectical that articulates both political and psychological ironies politically the play shows according to arpana dharwadkar the play shows tughlaq's futile attempts to be just and liberal towards a majority hindu population that is obliged as a muslim ruler to persecute in the first scene of the play that is set in delhi in 1327 tughlaq has invited all his people subjects to celebrate a new system of justice which he says will work i quote without any consideration of might or weakness or religion or creed on the stage the only character to benefit from this utopian move is a lowly muslim washerman aziz aziz has assumed the identity of a poor hindu brahman in order to win a false judgment against the sultan and secure a comfortable position at the court along with bounty later in the first scene tughlaq announces his decision to shift his capital from delhi to daulatabad or deoghar this city is 800 miles away from the deccan plateau and because daulatabad according to tughlaq is a city of hindus and as the capital it will symbolize the bond between muslim and hindus and tughlaq wishes to develop and strengthen his kingdom by this reconciliation and new secular values this reasoning so alienates provincial muslim noblemen and religious leaders that they plot to assassinate tughlaq although tughlaq foils the coup in his palace he could reconceive the move to the deccan and as an act of vengeance upon the people of delhi so his plan to move or shift the capital had two reasons number one to safeguard the capital from the invasion of the mongols 
of the Chinese, of the Afghans. And number two, to reduce the power of the monetary class of the Sayyids, the Amirs. Therefore, the collective journey to Dalatabad that was imposed on the subject becomes a nightmare. And through the journey, we have the scenes of starvation, disease and death. The entire scene six to seven, we have the same scene where we have the scenes of starvation, disease and death. When the action resumes in Dalatabad after a year's interval in scene eight, Tughlaq subjects are hardened to a life of loneliness, punishment and cathartic violence. At the end of the play, Tughlaq is left to contemplate in dismay, famine, rebellions, economic chaos and the signal of the collapse of his empire. On the ironic level, we have different undercurrents in the play. Tughlaq's sadistic manipulative impulses that undercut his image of himself as an exemplary ruler is loaded in irony. So from scenes two, scenes two to scene four, these ironies show Tughlaq strengthening his position among his subject, among his friend, among his adversaries, and even trying to explain to historian Barani, but gradually find that he can not control rebellion to that extent as he expected. So the historical characters and the theatrical representation becomes a matter of much critical debate in theatres of independence, drama theory and urban performance in India since 1947, published in 2005. Arpana Bhargava Dharvatkar has extensively analyzed the effects of historical representation in the play. Connor's reorganization of history, his use of the doppelganger motif, the complex verbal structure and the psychological pattern of the play, all these are also analyzed, notably by U. R. Anant Murthy in his introduction to the English translation of Tugla. So we find a multifold engagement with history that lies behind the words and functions differentially. In the process of reading and watching, some of these meanings may dominate stage productions, while others are germane to the critical rather than the producible interpretation. So Tukla retrieves and makes current the relatively unfamiliar phases of Islamic imperialism in India, known as the Sultanate period, 12th to the 16th century. The golden age of classical Hinduism has been over and now the new age has come. And this dominant political cultural force on the subcontinent is guided by the impulsive policies of the ruling class. The Sultanate is historically important. It's as a record of Islamic history, the gradual evolution of several political institution, administrative system, the new complications because of the religious interest and confrontation. So in the collective memory of Indian audience, it has been further aggravated by the memories of partition. So effectively, marginalized by the later periods of Mughal and British imperialism, this rivalry has expanded. Connors play reinscribes narrative of Tughlaq in the audience's memory, refining the historical tradition through a detailed historical reenactment. So we have in the play the qualities of performance that represent, that uses a lavish proscenium production so in Ibrahim Al-Qazi's 1974 production at Dilli's Purana Killa placed in the 14th century drama on the ramparts of pre-modern Islamic fort, attempt to create that perfect conjecture of historical action and environment that could have been possible only in Delhi. So many productions of Tughla in different historical periods. So we have already more than 50 years of the play on the stage through so different historical epoch we have the representation of the history in new dimensions. The, text, the textual 
level of engagement with history in Tughlaq is linked with the dialectic of satiric and heroic perspectives in order to mediate with the nature of the historical record. So we now know from Barney's main work, Tuarike, Firuz Sahi and Fatavi Zahang Dari, we know about the six years of Tughlaq rule. And in this play, he appears as a character to directly comment on the making of history. Converse Tughlaq and the idea of India of the 1960. In the late 1960s, when the play was being produced, in the 70s, when the play was being produced, so we have several versions of the play among the audience through different historical periods. The complimentary commentary on the leadership crisis, the politics, begin in the play's opening scene with a strong invocation of the Gandhian paradigm of political action. One of Tughlaq's subjects remarks that Tughlaq is a king who isn't afraid to be human. So being human is his phrase, while another wonders why the emperor has to make such a fuss about being human and announce his mistakes to the whole world. Tughlaq has actually shocked his subject, both the his Hindus and the Muslims. First, by abolishing the Zizia tax, a discriminatory poll tax on Hindus prescribed in the Quran for non-believers. Secondly, he instituted a judicial process in which he can be sued even by his subject. The humility and the self-questioning necessary for such public confession of error are fundamental to Gandhi's political practice. For example, in the story of my experiments with truth, Gandhi is talking about this experiments with politics and justice. So we have seen in the play such experiments. So this precondition for political action, the theory of non-violence, Satyagraha, essentially as a weapon of the truthful, is a state of complete spiritual preparedness in a leader as well as in his among his followers. So at the beginning of Karnar's play, Tughlaq is seeking exactly such a state, an ideal utopia where he can work on satyagraha, non-violence, secularism, equal coexistence of the Hindus and the Muslims, equality in power, classlessness. He wants his people to follow him, but only if they have complete faith in him. From Delhi to Dalatabad. Karnar's hero is a rebellious actualist, as Erickson has used to define Gandhi, whose very passion and power make him want to make actual for others what actualizes him. It is in terms of Erickson's assessment of Gandhi that Karnar's early characterization of Tugla can best be understood. The great leader creates for himself and for many others, new choices and new cares. These he derives from a mighty drivenness, an intense and yet flexible energy, a shocking originality, a capacity to impose on his time what most concerns him, which he does so convincingly that his time believes this concern to have emanated naturally from ripe necessities. This revolutionary urge gradually fades towards the middle of the play and the self-purification characteristic of Gandhi is not visible in the case of Tughlaq. The renewed charismatic characteristic of Nehru can be seen in Tughlaq and as an architect of independent India, Nehru's visionary principles approach to public action is best explained through the action that Tughlaq initiates. So we remember that under his leadership, India was integrated with his blood and as Nehru said, there was much in her that instinctively thrilled him. According to Jawaharlal Nehru, I was not interested in making some political arrangements which would enable our people to carry on more or less as before, only a little better. I felt they had war stores of suppressed energy and ability. I wanted to re release these and make them feel young and vital. In Kannar's Tughlaq, the same poetic imagination is there in the character. 
Tughlaq expresses to his stepmother the same desire for transformative union of his kingdom, union with his people, so that he may share with them the heady knowledge that history is ours to play with. Ours now, we are the makers of history, so we must write our own history. If the ruling character talks about writing history, taking the subject into account, what can be more idealistic than this? For Tughlaq as for Nehru, the sense of intense identity with the people is closely linked with both a desire for cultural modernity as well as an acute self-consciousness about history. So we learn from the pages of history and we modify our present according to the, according to the mistakes, according to the strengths, the pros and cons of history. So we have in this play Tughlaq who similarly announces that he has to mend his subjects, ignorant minds before he can think of their souls. So elevation of the mind, elevation of the soul, that is what Tughlaq is looking at. He also describes to the courtier Sahibuddin that he hopes of building a new future of India. The presence of historian Barani as a character in the play also ensures that Tughlaq is always conscious of his role as a historical subject and the shaper of history. So in his midnight address of 1947, 15th of August, Nehru spoke of India's tryst with destiny. Tughlaq also talks about this. They gave me what I wanted. They gave me power. They gave me strength to shape my thought, strength to act, strength to recognize myself. So this unification of the, of the independent will, the free will of the ruler and the consent of the subject matters in the play. The crisis of secular nationhood, nationhood in India was there. Condor traces the political failures of the nation in the play Tughlaq to a complex ambivalence in the personality and intentions of the leader and to the ungovernableness of the people. The central crisis of the play is the ability, is the inability of the subject to reconcile differences. Muhammad bin Tughlaq ignored Muslim Sharia or canon law and attempted to rule and administer justice along what is now called secular humanist, liberal humanist justice system. In doing so, he naturally antagonized the, the powerful class of the Saids and the Ulemas, the religious leaders and the scholars whose influence in political and administrative circles was there, gradually diminished and Tughlaq gradually had more power in his hands. Romila Thapar notes that the Orthodox Hindus and the Muslims alike restricted and resisted whatever Tughlaq was trying to do. Although the Muslims ruled the infidels or the Hindus called them barbarians, but there was always a kind of coexistence, mutual cooperation among the subject. Tughlaq presents a full blown version of the crisis of leadership, especially after the partition of India, and believe that occurs within a culture divided along the lines the historians suggest. The secular humanist or the liberal humanist principles of Tughlaq are non-Quranic in principles. And Kannar's protagonist initially refuses to impose any kind of monolithic order on his divergent subject. So we have different views of secularism coming in the play, whether secularism is the separation of the state and religion that Tughlaq tries to achieve, or is secularism is the unity in diversity, the coexistence of different religions together is a matter of considerable debate even today. As with Tughlaq, politics of humility, Kannad's use of secular ideal and Tughlaq's enlightened policies and Kannad's objectivist view of historical egalitarianism, all these combined together and we have 
a mixed response to the subject. For the plays communally divided characters, selfhood lies not in unity and equality, but in difference. The negative equilibrium of the hatred that is generated through suspicion and the problematics of religious discourse, religious coexistence become the subject matter of the play. Tugluk's quest for harmony in his attempt to dissolve the difference between the Hindu and the Muslim unlocks a liberal and symbolic mind or action and this represents the emergence of modernity even during that pre-modern period. Tughlaq is most concerned about being just not only to his Hindu subject but also to every person belonging to the underprivileged challenge classes. So we have the masquerades of Aziz as a Brahmin and his masquerade as the Caliph at the end of the play. Tughlaq succeeds in persuading Sheikh Imanuddin to act as mediator with Ainun Mulk because peace would prevent the shedding of Muslim blood. He decides to move on Dalatabad because it would be exemplary for a Muslim Sultan to have a Hindu capital. All these are contradictions that are there. History will of course judge what he did, whether the work was right or wrong. In Kanner's play, history is reenacted in front of an audience removed from that particular historical space, the 13th century space, the time and history. All these are translated into theatrical action and these are contextualized against contemporary social media. Historicization helps the audience to see the content of things and Kannad uses episodic collage, not essentially a chronicle. A major point of Kannad's representation of history is that he shows the past as past and this goes on to show the crisis of history as contemporary. So we must note this. He presents historical past as past and goes on to show the crisis of history as contemporary. True, this, true to the spirit of the Brechtian epic theatre, dialectical theatre, which, which attempted to alienate the spectator, spectator by maintaining a psychic distance, the spectators here are also engaged to participate in the debate and to seek a solution to the crisis not inside the theatre but outside the theatre. The thesis, antithesis, the contradictions in the theme, in the subject, in the action, in the character are all present. The synthesis is not done by the playwright. At the end of the play, Tughlaq presents himself as a part of history. I quote, as a part of history, left awaiting the judgment of history. At the end of play, Tughlaq talks about his transformation. I quote from the play, for five years sleep had avoided me and now suddenly it is flooding back. However, when we see him last in the play, the last stage direction of the play, we find him, I quote from Kannar's play, he looks around dazed and frightened as though he can't comprehend where he is. The spectators are therefore divided into opposing forces. The problem is left unresolved whether Tughlaq is a genius destroyed by adverse circumstances or Tughlaq is an oriental despot, a tyrant and a lunatic mad ruler. The spectators are left to solve problems outside the theatre. Instead of proposing a solution to the problem, the actor, after raising the problem, seek solution or solutions from the audience. The contradiction finally invites the audience to think about solutions to the problem raised and infer synthesis once the performance is over. Thus history becomes open-ended, unsaturated, multifaceted, multiformed, a dialogic discourse in Kannad's Tughlaq. Thank you very much.